Perhaps one of the most important things that CDC did in the beginning was to establish a surveillance case definition for AIDS. My first task was to set up surveillance. In order to do surveillance, you have to have a definition. A surveillance definition uh, is a different purpose than, let's say, something you're going to do for clinical care. So a doctor might think you have an AIDS-like syndrome, uh, but if it doesn't meet our surveillance definition, we'll keep track of it. You know, a lot of surveillance definitions will have subclassifications, definite cases, susceptible or, or uh, uh, probable cases, possible cases. Uh, and so this is not unusual. We call them A cases and B cases, for example. Uh, but they're cases that meet your definition uh, that you can count. Because what you want to do is be able to compare your numbers today with your numbers five years from now. Are you making improvement or are you not? And if, you, and, and if, and if your definition wobbles with the times and with what people want to call things and you don't have firm boundaries, the number today can't be compared with the number five years from now. Uh, and so surveillance is a much different kind of activity than, let's say, a clinical diagnosis. In the beginning, this definition was meant for surveillance purposes. They will say, well, it was not meant in, in the beginning. Um, as being a clinical tool. So um, you can have very open and frank discussions about the limitations of, of applying this definition in clinical routine. But then if you look at what is happening on the ground, this is exactly what is, what is being done. They create reporting forms for surveillance purposes. But in the end, of course, the clinician on the ground, they use them for clinical use. They are not given kind of two definitions, one for surveillance, one for clinical routine. And that would be totally absurd. There is no other disease uh, where you get two definitions, one for reporting and one for treatment. This is, this is nonsense. Well, AIDS is the name of the disease. AIDS is a disease. AIDS is the disease. AIDS is a new disease. There isn't a disease. There's a lot of diseases. They're all under the same ridiculous umbrella, the disease, right? As long as we look at it as a disease that we can cure somehow by understanding how to kill the thing that causes it, we're missing the point. Totally. That's the big problem. They call it a disease. They said they're dying of a disease. Simply spoken, if you have tuberculosis and antibody against HIV, then we call it AIDS. If you have tuberculosis and no antibody against HIV, now we call it tuberculosis as we used to. It's an old disease and a new name when we find antibody to the virus. When I saw my first AIDS patient, this guy was actually suffering from lymphoma. He has uh, so-called Burkitt lymphoma. And all of a sudden, they told me, my colleagues told me, well, this guy has got AIDS now. And I, why, why, he, why he's got AIDS now? I, I see he's suffering from lymphoma. Yeah, well, he, he reacted positive in, a, in the HIV test. And I, I thought a while and said, well, okay, but that's not a new clinical disease. It's still a lymphoma. So uh, um, everybody was talking about the big, the big AIDS epidemic at that time. And now we have the first AIDS patients here. But I said, well, for me, it's not an epidemic in the classic sense. For me, it's an epidemic of a new test. And uh, that's what we know now was one of the problems of the HIV AIDS epidemic, that 29 of old diseases are now called AIDS if you have antibodies to HIV. It is very deceptive uh, to give a new name to old, well-known diseases. On, on a scientific level, and it is not, not at all helpful on a clinical level, because 
we need to treat the underlying disease. I mean, I mean, that's a definition, you might say. It's a definition to say that when you have HIV, you know, we call the immune deficiency AIDS. I mean, it's just a label that we use. Um, there, like I said, I've said, there are other ways you could produce a condition that looks like AIDS, but they too will be some source that causes a severe uh, defect in the immune response. Immune systems have been compromised throughout medical history. You know, and there are certain conditions why they get compromised. It wasn't one factor ever. You know, what is it's a woman in 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 in, in the Sahara who gets a disease called SLIM, which is now called AIDS. Is she getting sick for the same reason that a man who was in the mine shaft in 1984, fucking his brains out, comes down with a con is it? Well, I would suggest to you, no. They're not the same conditions. But what do they have in common? What do they have in common? That question's not being answered because it's a virus. It's a virus. AIDS is by definition acquired immune deficiency syndrome. We have known uh, many, the major, and actually all of the sources of acquired immune deficiency for, you know, 50 years at least, maybe 100 years. The, pr the leading cause of acquired immune deficiency around the world is malnutrition. You get malnutrition, you can come down with any and all of the AIDS-defining diseases. It's documented. Uh, another sort, and that's one of the leading causes of AIDS, pediatric AIDS in the United States and the Western world, is malnourished premature babies. This was known even before AIDS, you know, before uh, 1981. They were generally uh, premature babies, they don't have a functioning immune system, they come down with pneumocystis cranii pneumonia, for example, age-defining disease. Or uh, drug-addicted mothers. Eighty percent of the, the mothers who have uh, AIDS babies admit to using recreational drugs during pregnancy. Those drugs can cause age-defining diseases. Uh, the other group of people who are well known to uh, uh, get acquired immune deficiency are chemotherapy patients. People who are taking chemotherapy for cancer. They come down with the same diseases that AIDS patients do because the chemotherapy destroys the immune system, at least depresses it, and you can actually wipe it out completely if you do it long enough. And uh, they come down with AIDS. And then the third basic group that comes down with acquired immune deficiency, organ transplant recipients. People who get kidney transplants, liver transplants, they are given drugs like cyclosporin A intentionally to depress their immune system so they don't lose the liver and don't lose the kidney. And they come down with AIDS-defining diseases. And when the physician sees it, he knows why, and they reduce the level of these drugs. The only thing that happened new as of 1981 was not the diseases, it was who was getting it. As of 1981, in those days, in the early days, it was 100% were gay men between 25 and 50. It was who was getting that was new, not the diseases themselves. And it turned out, that these, these gay men that were coming down with pneumocystis cranii, Kaposi sarcoma, cytomegalovirus, and so on and so forth, had a history of chronic, of chronic drug use, heroin, cocaine, amphetamines, poppers, and that sort of thing. In fact, 98% of all AIDS cases in the United States and Europe are, have a history of drug use. Two-thirds, roughly, are gay men. One-third, the CDC says, are IV drug users, or a euphemism for heterosexual drug users. We have about 1% annually of hemophiliacs, they come down with the AIDS-defining diseases uh, before AZT, before the introduction of AZT, uh, due to the proteins th that they had to inject, factor VIII, to keep them from, from dying of hemophilia. Well, chronic uh, uh, injections of protein also cause uh, immune depressive, depressive disorders. In fact, they can lead to the symptoms that are indistinguishable from AIDS. I was there at the beginning of this crisis. You know, I have stayed involved in this crisis and I have tried to help people live. I think more people have died because of the theories that have been promulgated about the cause and the treatment of AIDS than not. And I think the quality of the living of many of these people who depended and trusted the, the kinds of drugs that were put forward and the theories that were put forward is cruel punishment. They, that the quality of their lives was very poor. AIDS is not really a disease, is that correct? The term AIDS was coined early on and it meant acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. 
In medicine, a syndrome is a series of symptoms that are thought to be related to each other. In fact, they have so many diseases in there, it's, uh, I said, it's almost uh, absurd. It's a bewildering combination of things. Many of them have nothing to do with each other. I said dementia and diarrhea. What do they have in common? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I mean, one is something in your head, and the other is something in your ass. Yeah? <laughs> there are kind of infections, almost all of them, that exist out there. It's not like only a person with AIDS would get them, but only a person with a severely de damaged immune system gets them. Yeah. No, they are not. No, uh, about two-thirds of them are immune suppression related diseases, like the microbial AIDS diseases. All the microbes benefit from a defective immune system. But dementia, Kaposi's sarcoma, or lymphoma, or cervical cancer, or weight loss are not consequences of immune deficiency. They have nothing to do with it. They don't require immune deficiency to no, cause them. No, no, no. There's a common belief that it's immune suppression is involved. Harold referred to it. Our data would argue it's the opposite, that it's immune stimulation. That you can have Kaposi's epidemiologist tell me in the absence of immune suppression. What about cervical cancer? Because that doesn't require immune suppression either. Yeah, no, uh, that was really a, uh, I, I, I still think, and I've actually published uh, that, that that, that, that uh, uh, does not appear to be related to HIV infection. Though in 1993, it was added to the list as an AIDS-defining illness. TB was a real tough disease for us because um, uh, tuberculosis occurs in both immunocompromised and immunocompetent people. And so actually it wasn't one of our initial diagnoses to be AIDS, because more than half the cases in the literature up till then were in immunocompetent individuals as opposed to immunosuppressed. So that didn't make our list of diseases till about I met Joe McCormick in 76 um, during the Ebola outbreak in, in, in Zaire. We went together in 83 to, uh, to Kinshasa and uh, with the, the team that did the first work on documenting heterosexual uh, epidemic of AIDS in, uh, in Africa. And uh, he brought with him uh, an enormous experience in terms of um, outbreak investigation, epidemiologic investigation. and. Uh, um, yeah, it was a very great collaboration. Okay. When you guys created that, did that help you begin to establish prevalence and figure out what stage the epidemic was in Africa? Yeah, in 83, we, um, our, our goal was to document that there is an AIDS epidemic in Kinshasa, which after a few weeks we were absolutely certain about. What happened then is that in um, uh, 84, a project CEDA was created with uh, Jonathan Mann as the director and um, that a project which was a collaborative effort of the Centers for Disease Control of the US, National Institutes of Health, the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp where I was then working and uh, our uh, Zairean colleagues and that a project really documented all the basics of AIDS in, uh, in Africa. Uh, heterosexual transmission, that there is no household transmission. We didn't know are mosquitoes transmitting HIV. I mean, things that now we all know, but uh, in the early days, in the 80s, we had no clue. Um, mother to child transmission, um, the clinical spectrum, uh, HIV prevalence, uh, also what are the risk factors. Uh, we saw also that sex workers have much higher rates of infection and so on. So that project really remarkably in a few years time um, really uh, put together the, the picture of what we know is AIDS in Africa today. The first AIDS meeting uh, in, on the continent of Africa that was held by WHO at least, and I'm not aware of any other meeting, was in 1985 in, in Bangui. Um, Fakhri Assad uh, asked me to set that meeting up 
and I contacted uh, colleagues at the Institute Pasteur in Bangui at the time because they, I knew they had a good facility for meeting and for organizing a meeting in, in those days. And so uh, I worked with them to set up uh, the meeting and I thought it was a good place to have the international community uh, because it would get the French involved. And the French through their Institutes Pasteur had, uh, had and still have to some degree a very potent program for being able to, to really launch investigations in many countries on HIV and they did, they did that uh, to some degree. So anyway, we organized and Fakhri agreed that we would set, uh, that we would have the meeting in Bangui. And uh, at that time, uh, Luc Montagnier was involved and he had already become very well known. So he helped to, uh, he and his colleagues helped to, to set up, although he didn't attend the meeting. And uh, we were able to get the international community. Now, I, there had already been a national, an international meeting on, on HIV, but it had been held in Europe. And I felt that if we really wanted to have a meeting about AIDS in Africa, it needed to be in Africa. And so that was where we set up the first meeting. And uh, many of the, of the uh, players, even today, who, uh, who are still involved with HIV, uh, came to that meeting in 1985, and that's where we developed the uh, Bangui criteria for the, di for the clinical diagnosis of AIDS. As you might imagine, in those days, working in Africa, we didn't have, even though by 1985 there was a serologic test, you could do antibody tests and, and make a, a serologic diagnosis for exposure, most of Africa didn't have access to this, was new, um, and they didn't have access to it. So how are we going to count cases? what were the criteria and one of the things that we did in that meeting was to sit down and hash out the so-called Bangui criteria for the diagnosis of AIDS in Africa and that's been used for literally since then as a, as, as a set of criteria, clinical tri criteria for being able to diagnose AIDS and that helped in the overall effort to count cases because we needed to know what was the impact of the, uh, of the epidemic. So one of the things that came out of that, in addition to some collaborations and other things that happened, were these, uh, these clinical criteria for the diagnosis of AIDS. Yeah, I noticed in your book you said that was your main point, to come up with, right. with that, right. that clinical criteria. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you just briefly explain how does the Bungi definition work? Like how, how is it applied in, in, in terms of medicine? Well, it's set up, it's set up so that, that, uh, that uh, weight loss, and I, I must tell you it's been 20, over 20 years and I probably can't cite every single one of the criteria, but the, the idea was to say what would be a simple way for a clinician to look at a patient and be reasonably sure that they have AIDS. And one of them clearly was uh, prolonged weight loss, um, uh, an opportunistic, some kind of, and, and for there it was either TB or a fungus infection that was, that was going to be obvious, that didn't require a laboratory to, to investigate it. Um, and uh, there probably were a couple of other criteria that were perhaps a little bit uh, more minor that were involved. But, but the purpose of it, the principle was, how can you provide simple clinical criteria that you don't need a laboratory, you don't need a microscope, you don't need that, that, a, that a doctor can look at a patient and say that uh, this patient likely has AIDS. And that was the purpose of it. And, and, and among the, the, the major criteria where it was a, a severe weight loss and, uh, and a evidence of some kind of opportunistic infection, fungus infection of the mouth, for example, or TB, um, that so, those were the, 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 the major criteria for, for AIDS. Well, in clinical terms, it just doesn't make sense. It is not helpful in, in any way. You, you, we are confronted frequently with sick people. That's our job to treat them. In order to treat them in the best way, what we need, essentially need is to make the best diagnosis we can come up with to, to, to treat them accordingly. And the diagnosis which is just giving another label to well-known treatable diseases doesn't help on, on, on treating these patients. The people that, that, that came up with the concept of AIDS, they were able to conquer all of us. That's why I'm saying this is more a political stunt, because it was very, it was a group of, I, I guess it should be a group of engineers, you know, people that have been able to, 
think of all these things and connect them so that they look so powerful, so that they look so unconquerable, so that they look so fearful I and mean, fearful. You know, when you think of the word AIDS, it is as though it's this new thing that has just come in that is more fashionable in disease terms. You know, it, it's, it, it becomes even more scary. In 1985, the World Health Organization held a meeting in the capital of the Central African Republic. Joseph McCormick was chosen to preside over that meeting. He's not African, he's not an African leader, he's a guy from the, the US CDC. What's he doing over there? Well, here's what he's doing over there. He goes over there and he says, we gotta come up with a definition for AIDS. Now, why would you do that? We needed criteria that were immediately available to clinicians and for public health people to be able to get some estimate of the number of cases they were seeing. That was important because it allowed um, the African countries to start documenting the problem and it gave something to clinicians in Africa to, uh, to diagnose AIDS. They could discover AIDS all over Africa at that point. They could say that we are all at risk but they could say it's spreading around the world. They could say it affects women as much as men because almost anyone in an African hospital could be diagnosed with AIDS without having to do the HIV test at all. How were the official AIDS estimates created for Africa and how credible were they in your opinion in the very beginning? Well, in the very beginning, we had very little data. I mean, John Mann, based on his sort of studies in Africa and what data he showed, had before the global program was even developed, he made a, an estimate of between five and 10 million uh, globally, most of that in Africa. And uh, when I finally got to Geneva in 87 and looked at the available data, uh, I told John that at most I could come up with about five million based on what data was available and the assumptions. Five million in Africa? Or? Five million globally. Uh, most of that in Africa. We well, you know, as Mark Twain said, uh, there are lies and then there are damned lies, and finally at the very bottom there are statistics. And I think what he was referring to is this probably quite <clears throat> old habit of statisticians of manipulating the data in order to show a conclusion that's, that's preconceived. So the Bangu definition, which is based on very unspecific clinical symptoms like fever, weight loss, or di diarrhea, or cough, these are symptoms which are widespread in, in, in poor countries uh, where people suffer from diseases, well-known diseases, with exactly these symptoms. You have diarrhea and you've lost a little bit of weight. And I also see that you, love, uh, you live on a beautiful uh, sewage canal where all your neighbors uh, slaughter animals, throw their crap and their piss, and uh, by the way, your kids play back there. And then you walk uh, half a mile away? Is it? Oh, it's two miles, I'm sorry, two miles away to a depression in the dirt that you draw murky water from and you bring that home. And that's your water supply and you bathe in that too. You have AIDS. If America want to help Africa or to see AIDS disappear in Africa, what they must do, give the people food, give the people clean water. After that, you won't see the AIDS in Africa. The AIDS in Africa is about poverty. That is the poverty. That's the number one killer disease in Africa. All the facts on HIV and AIDS with Criselda on Metro FM Talk. It's World AIDS Day. There are functions, there are gatherings. The international theme is Stop AIDS, Stop HIV and AIDS. Keep the promise. So many years later, we keep saying the same things. HIV, HIV, HIV. And yet... Africa does not have its own voice when it comes to response towards AIDS doesn't have its own messaging. Your multinationals, they don't even want to listen to the cries of African people. To them it's more about, let's come up with this thing and, and define it as AIDS. What is AIDS? AIDS. Yes. Uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't tell you much on AIDS. <laughs> Men's, this is the, 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 the new, new language which has been brought by 
I don't know who, you see. I, I can't actually, I can't actually explain that, uh, rather than just knowing that people just simply say that AIDS is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And maybe we will need a clear explanation from the experts that what is the meaning of AIDS. And, and if, if, if they actually say AIDS was not there previously, what were the diseases which were troubling the, the, the communities? Because these kinds of diseases were, were, were prevailing. We did have patients with uh, the conditions we now regard as AIDS defining, even before the advent of AIDS. Like we did have patients with Kaposi sarcoma, which is the skin disease that I was talking about. It doesn't necessarily mean that any patient presenting with Kaposi sarcoma has the virus. Now, new, new ways, new terminologies have been brought to us. We end up being we a little bit Confused. Daniel, Jacob. A lot of people he, he, here is very sick and is very tired. What kind of sickness do you see around here? It's HIV AIDS. What is AIDS? We don't know. We don't know. There are cases whereby people are labeled as HIV positive when you have not tested by even the health officials. Whether you're positive or negative, they don't even know. But then they just choose to label you because they, when they look at you, they look at you, you know, with those eyes that are hunting for somebody who's HIV positive. You can't cough because coughing is, is AIDS. You can't lose weight because losing weight is AIDS. It's not muscle wasting anymore. You can't have TB, which is curable within six months because it's classified or packaged as AIDS. You go to Africa, you go to hospitals and you say, what is AIDS? And I did, I said, what do you mean when you say AIDS here? in this hospital, Kampala, Uganda, say, random example. They show you TB, they show you malaria, they show you sick, emaciated, weak, dying people. And you ask them, okay, but why are you calling that AIDS? And they say, well, we call everything AIDS here. It's a formula. There was a Time Magazine article about Africa with pictures of emaciated awful people and it said uh, more or less look at these pictures and weep uh, um, well I come from Africa I mean I was born there went to medical school there my mother was a doctor in Zimbabwe Rhodesia then where I grew up and I can tell you that in 1940 you know, I could take a camera and go around and make pictures equally as horrible as that no HIV oh, oh I'm sure it's true that not everyone who has AIDS has even had a antibody test, not to mention isolation of virus, but if you want to go do it, you could do it, but there's no reason. You, you know, if you, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you don't have to do a, uh, a genetic um, blood test to see if it's really a duck. I mean, very soon you see what, it, what the disease is. You don't have to do a laboratory test on a lot of these things. So. The Bangui, uh, that's not a perfect, that's a clinical definition. That's not, people could have TB and not have HIV and fulfill the Bangui criteria. They'd lose weight, they'd have TB, uh, and they could look like they have AIDS when they don't. In a World Health Organization publication, Dr. Chin writes, it should be emphasized that the surveillance definitions for AIDS were not intended to be reliable indicators of HIV infection. Once you put so much energy, so much concentration on one thing, you are eventually you are legitimizing that thing. You are saying, it is real, it is there, it is happening. Do you think AIDS goes away if poverty goes away? Absolutely. You take away poverty, you, you're giving people an ability to fight infections. In Africa, the AIDS definition was established in 85, you know, a year after the official definition in the United States, although they were totally separate illnesses, you know, series of illnesses. Nevertheless, we decided that those people had the same disease. 
Why in 1985 could we not apply the CDC's definition in the United States to Africa? Uh, the, the level of, of laboratory and clinical uh, expertise and facilities are just not present in the majority of uh, African countries. So to diagnose histoplasmosis infection, to diagnose pneumocystis carinii infection, uh, there's just no isolation methods for this. So to rely on diseases that had to be diagnosed by laboratory methods precluded really the use of that definition in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Clinicians very, very fast realized the problems uh, with working with this so-called uh, Bangui definition because a number of diseases have these unspecific symptoms like uh, diarrhea, infectious diarrhea, like respiratory infections or tuberculosis, which all of them are widespread in Africa. So in another African country in Ivory Coast, um, doctors sat together and tried to improve the Bangui definition because they thought the Bangui definition had a poor outcome in clinical routine. And they came up with something called the Abidjan definition, which is kind of an um, amended Bangui definition. When countries adopted this Bangui definition, they adapted it according to their national needs. Some make it more strict, some make it less strict. Different countries in Africa varied the Bangui yeah. definition. Yeah. What was the reason for that? Why did they all just use one common definition? Uh, again, I don't know the major reasons, but I would su suspect that in some countries they felt they were a little more sophisticated than in others. And uh, you have, you know, along with the epidemic of HIV, uh, epidemics of HIV AIDS experts. And some of them will not necessarily uh, adhere to any international definition, they'll make up their own definition. Just to give you an example, Uganda included in its uh, definition for AIDS uh, tuberculosis. So the tuberculosis is an AIDS-defining disease. In Tanzania, they are using a more strict version, adapted, nationally adapted version of the Bangui definition. So instead of three clinical symptoms, um, they ask for four clinical symptoms. And in, as compared to Uganda, in Tanzania, they ask for an HIV test. Nevertheless, in one of the annual reports, um, the Minister of Health in Tanzania reports that only 33% of uh, reported AIDS cases actually fulfilled these uh, AIDS-defining criteria. Although 1,320 cases would not strictly qualify to be called AIDS cases, we have taken them as, as, as cases assuming that those who reported them just made an omission at the stage of compiling the forms. Now, the Ministry of Health counts as, a as AIDS cases even patients who have not, not even fulfilled these cr the criteria of these four very unspecific cases, and they count them as AIDS cases and further continue uh, to report them to Geneva, and then further on Estimates are added for underreporting. A similar thing happened in Latin America when clinicians over there realized they had problems and with working with the Bangui definition because of the poor outcome. So they came up with another definition based on clinical symptoms called the Caracas definition. All of them tried to find a way to, to diagnose what we know as AIDS based on unspecific clinical symptoms while all what we know about AIDS is there are no typical clinical symptoms.
You open the New York Times and you see a story saying that four million Africans are infected with HIV. It doesn't imply that those people have been tested. It implies that they're linked via tortuous mathematical models to a woman who's tested positive in one of the sort of annual surveys conducted in African pregnancy clinics. The three questions that we have to ask when we see statistics about AIDS cases or AIDS deaths or AIDS orphans in Africa are the fundamental questions we ask of any number. Number one, who created the statistic? Number two, how was this statistic created? And number three, uh, for what purpose was it created? Testing in Africa was never very important. The, the Bangui definition made it clear that AIDS in Africa was fever, diarrhea, weight loss, all endemic African problems. But you still want to put a good face on it. And you want to test. And the reason you test is so you can come out with startling numbers. Like there are 60 gazillion people in Africa who now have HIV and they all need drugs now. What kind of big mistakes were made in early testing? Well, there were, there, there, this gets very technical. But the mistakes that were made is that people thought you could do the test with a single sort of control, that is a negative control, when in fact what you really had to do was to use each person's serum in Africa. Now this worked well, you didn't need all these controls in other parts of the country, in other parts of the globe, but in Africa because pe probably because people are exposed to so many parasites and so many different infections, they tend to have a lot of of background in their, in their uh, serum that made this test falsely positive. And so there were some instances where people found, for example, there was one study where people examined blood from a group of children in the, in the Congo and found 60% of them had antibodies to AIDS. And this was actually published. And it was because they didn't understand the limits of the test and they hadn't used the proper controls and so they way overestimated and a lot, and there were some other papers like that and they had to be withdrawn eventually. But you can see that it created a lot of, a lot of confusion because of that. What, I'm sorry, what do you mean by estimates? What, I don't know, you said that, they, that the children, are you mean estimating prevalence for the Yes, for the yes, yes. I mean, if you come in and say 60% of the children in this test were, were positive for HIV, I mean, that's a staggering number. We don't even have today any places with that high number. And so you can see, I mean, if somebody says to you, 60% of the kids in, this, in, the, in the eastern part of the Congo are infected with, a with AIDS, because that's what the antibody tests that they did said, I mean, you can imagine that would be uh, pretty startling. Some of the claims made about Africa, especially about the Great Lakes region, at a time when Peter Peart of UNAIDS would acknowledge the tests were totally defective, and the predictions made were disastrously incorrect. I think that they traumatized the psyches of entire nations with claims that we now know are not right. And they never said sorry. Yes. Did the CDC go back and test all the people they had diagnosed with AIDS up until that point? <laughs> no, we did not. Realistically, you should not diagnose AIDS as acquired immune deficiency syndrome without evidence of HIV infection. In 1987, the CDC made two mind-boggling changes in the definition of AIDS, which are in effect today. You can be diagnosed with AIDS without ever having an HIV test. Uh, matter of fact, the CDC acknowledges that uh, at least 40,000 AIDS cases in the United States were never even tested for antibodies to HIV. So a lot of it is presumptive. The presumptive that there was nothing done, like in Africa. The doctor says, this looks to me like AIDS, and reports it faithfully to the World Health Organization or the CDC. And that's exactly what's happening here. There's a gay guy with Kaposi. Do we need to hear more? <laughs> 
records to the world, goes to the public health office as a reported AIDS case. Do you think anybody's going to question it? How were you diagnosed with AIDS since you didn't have the benefit of an HIV test? Well, I had a, in 1987, I had a lesion on my arm, a little spot that was raised in, in the color, and they biopsied it, they cut it, they cut it out, and it was KS, <clears throat> Kaposi sarcoma. And so the doctor told you you had AIDS? Yeah. Can you look at somebody and identify them as being HIV infected without doing an HIV test? Well, I could uh, shake hands with him <laughs> and see, uh, yes, a little fever. Uh, I could guess, uh, yes, sweat and a little uh, fever in his hands. I could say this is someone who has some kind of infection. And of course, if it is a gay man or a drug abuser, I will uh, guess it's probably HIV. The definition of AIDS has broadened over time. It was revised in 1985, and then again in 1987. The definition has changed many times. The biggest change was probably in 1993, which they then, you know, added the CD4 count uh, uh, and HIV, and you know, so you, you could not even be ill, but if you had a CD4 count consistently below 200, you now had AIDS. Part of the intent of um, changing the definition in 1993 was indeed in an effort to keep um, the impression in the public mind that AIDS was continuing to increase. In fact, AIDS cases that were reported to the CDC uh, by the old definition had peaked in 1992. It was clear that they were plateauing. And uh, based on the old definition, AIDS cases um, uh, have continued to plummet. A closer look at the Centers for Disease Control's documents reveals that AIDS numbers actually declined in 1993, but a retroactive definition change increased the estimates by more than 100 percent. If U.S. AIDS cases were to cross the Canadian border, about two-thirds would no longer be AIDS because they were diagnosed in the U.S. based on the low immune cell count definition that's not valid in Canada. I was interviewing a few people in Health Canada, mm -hmm. and they don't recognize the 200 count. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, in the U.S., I think some, um, some of the reasons for it relates to um, uh, the activist community were very concerned that there were a, a, a large number of folks that were HIV infected that were um, ill but didn't meet criteria for AIDS and thus were not eligible for certain, um, certain resources. And so um, I think um, through the, and also through the active, through some input from the activist, com activist community and, um, and so forth that, you know, in the U.S. We, changed, we, we lowered the criteria to include asymptomatic people with CD4 counts. But there are a number of countries that don't use that as criteria. CDC felt it was important to utilize the case definition of a way of demonstrating a need for management of people with end-stage infection. And uh, we wanted them to be, their doctors to be alert to that management need, and we wanted uh, their insurance companies to be alert to paying for the uh, conditions. There were a number of people that were getting treatments for AIDS, either trimethoprim sulfa for pneumocystis, uh, and the states were trying to recoup some of their uh, their dollars. So the definition then had to, they wanted to use the same definition for surveillance and for clinical diagnosis for uh, reimbursement parts. So there, so there were some politics and dollars and cents that impact almost every decision in public health, believe it or not, uh, that, that, that started coming into play in the 90s as people were looking at how to fund these things and how to get reimbursed for. What were they trying to get reimbursed for? What was that? Well, for, for uh, treatments for AIDS, for, uh, for uh, you know, Medicare and Medicaid and other kinds of payments. Uh, uh, if you couldn't document that you had a diagnosis of AIDS, you couldn't get, you know, monies that were set aside for AIDS funding for clinical care. If someone has a T-cell count of 200, he's then defined as being an AIDS patient. 
And what happens if he comes back to you two weeks later and his T cell is 350? Is he still considered AIDS? Well, if he was reported uh, to the health authorities, and there is a requirement for reporting patients with AIDS, if he was reported, uh, once he's reported, he is counted in the roles of people with AIDS. However, it really has no particular implication for him. If he is 350 two weeks later, that's terrific. But if he is someone who needed some kind of benefits from the state that depended on his having an AIDS diagnosis, he of course does now have an AIDS diagnosis. And if he was someone, for example, who was seeking disability, it will be easier for him to get disability once he's had an AIDS diagnosis, even if it was only for two weeks. So once you get an AIDS diagnosis, you're always considered an AIDS case? Yes. AIDS. Yes. Okay. You don't get taken off the rolls. I knew people that had four T cells but did not have AIDS and who were healthy and active in the world outside. And I knew people who had 400 T cells who couldn't get out of bed. And yet the person who had under 200 T cells could get all kinds of financial and ancillary services. The person who had above 200 or 200 T cells did not qualify. You have to remember that definition of 200 T cells meaning AIDS, that's a political definition. It's not a medical one. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, everybody's got to make their own, uh, to, to fit their own needs. Uh, and so, yeah, the CDC, uh, working with Health and Human Services, has, has uh, and Congress and others have, you know, these, these all come, come into play. It's a lot more complicated when you get things to certain effects. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. We now know that AIDS really represents a severe uh, breakdown of the immune system. It's really the end stage of HIV infection. And all of the conditions that occur at the end stage of HIV infection, uh, the serious ones, are included in the case definition. But the real definition of AIDS is a severe breakdown of the immune system, which can be measured in, in the laboratory. You can be perfectly healthy with a T cell count of less than 200, but it'll still be an AIDS diagnosis. That's correct. You can be. When I got my CD4 count and it dropped below 200, I, I sort of freaked out. It was, and, it, and, and that freak out lasted, uh, I would say, about 20 minutes. And a friend then picked me up at the doctor. And I was crying, and he said, what's wrong? And I said, I have AIDS. <laughs> And I was just sort of freaking out, and he said, well, how do you feel? And I, I sort of brushed back the tears, and I said, well, actually, I sort of I feel fine. And he said, then what's the problem? And it was almost like a light bulb went off, and I was like, oh, I guess there is no problem. The CD4 uh, surrogate markers, which are really, uh, uh, they're absolutely of no use. They're, they're no better than a toss of a coin to determine the outcome of a patient, but the physicians have gotten so used to, to doing it, they still do it by habit, even though it's meaningless. It's worse than meaningless. It scares people to death when they get these numbers. I went back on medication when the doctor said, you have 222 T cells, I could have passed out. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I'm only 22 T cells away from getting eggs. I have to take medicine. I stopped doing the T cell counting because to me that's a, it's a very dangerous, slippery path to get into. And that's what happens to a lot of people. They're perfectly well, they feel just great, they're not sick, they've never had any condition, and just because one day the doctor says, dum da dum dum, 200, you fell below 200, ah, death sentence. And then you put it in the mind, and then that's it. You know, you really are a goner if you start believing in that stuff. I think we absolutely focus on lab results too much. And not just with HIV and AIDS, with anything, with cholesterol or anything, but certainly with HIV and AIDS, it's almost like we don't see the whole person. You don't see a person who 
is healthy, clinically healthy, as in not experiencing disease, you see a low CD4 count or a high viral load. And, and I think when you base treatment decisions solely on those numbers, which can fluctuate based on God only knows what, you know, how much sleep you got the night before, what your diet is like, what your stress level is like, what you believe about your HIV status, um, the, the pollution that you breathe in, the, the, you know, any, the stress, you know, like white coat hypertension, just this, you're afraid of needles, for God's sakes. All of these things, and God only knows what else, go into affecting your numbers. So to solely base treatment on a low CD4 count alone without the presence of, you know, other obvious signs of immunodeficiency, to me, never made much sense. Did your doctor pressure you to get on meds as soon as you hit 200? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I first tested positive, it was a, a point in HIV treatment, which was, is commonly referred to as hit hard, hit fast. And so as soon as a person tested positive on an antibody test, it didn't really matter what your numbers were, um, viral load or CD4 count. It was you get on a really strong regimen of anti-HIV medicine. And, you know, to the, the thought was to whack the virus as hard as you could immediately. And it wasn't really even dependent on lab results, let alone on clinical health. Over time, that's th thankfully changed quite a bit. But certainly when my numbers started to go below 200, and even when they were the highest my numbers have ever been have been at 300, um, there was a huge amount of pressure. Like if you don't go on these meds immediately, you're in big trouble, you know. And, and it seemed like every time I would go to a different doctor, they would pull a different, a different card and say, do you want to go blind with CMV retinitis or do you want to do you want to die of pneumonia or do you want to get AIDS related lymphoma or and you know it just to me it seemed like scare tactics I mean you want to educate people but it didn't seem to be particularly productive I think once I really took a stand and I really said look this is this is my policy I will decide on treatment based on clinical health alone and maybe you know take into consideration my labs but not have it be exclusively that that's when they started to calm down and say okay he's going to do his thing when he's ready and then you know the past few years have been considerably better and i found a nurse practitioner who i really get along well with who deeply respects my my opinions and she she really doesn't try and pressure me at all and so i'm very grateful for that Prior to 1997, the CDC provided a list <clears throat> of how many people were diagnosed with each AIDS-defining disease each year. They also provided the number of people who were diagnosed without any disease at all, just based on low CD4 immune cell counts. During the time that the CDC continued to report uh, the opportunistic illness that uh, triggered the diagnosis of AIDS in patients, um, the vast majority were due to uh, T-cell counts of less than 200. For example, as I recall, in the year 1993, uh, I believe about 66% of the AIDS diagnosis for that year were due to low T-cell counts. Um, 1994, 95, sometimes, I think once the numbers popped up to 80% of the diagnoses of AIDS in a year were due to um, low T-cell counts. In other words, perfectly healthy individuals being tagged as AIDS patients, thereby inflating the AIDS statistics. Table 12 was the breakdown of the number of AIDS cases over that, that year uh, according to the diseases over the various definitions of AIDS. And then Table 11 was the breakdown over a period of years. How many how it changed over the, for the various definitions over a period of years, four or five years. And both of those tables clearly showed this, this divergence, this separation between people who have antibodies to HIV and people who are actually sick. So you couldn't keep 
the CDC could not keep that going and have that divergence increase over time and then claim that AIDS is not going away. It ha you know, they don't want to say AIDS is going away because then they're out of business, pretty much. In 1997, this delineation stopped. Okay, in other words, there's, we no longer know, we know how many AIDS cases we, we, were reported to the CDC, but we no longer know the breakdown of the illnesses that uh, cause these diagnoses. All of these problems are solved by not reporting what the diseases are in the first place. Then nobody's going to pick them apart on the basis of what's really happening anymore because we don't see it. Right. We hear from the CDC it's AIDS and we assume that they have found HIV and that's all you get. Okay. And but nobody gets the odd idea, could it be Kaposi, which is now caused by something else? Is it diarrhea or is it cervical cancer in a homosexual? How could they get cervical cancer? Ah, obviously it's not an AIDS-defining disease, only for women. Oh, the virus causes one thing for women and something others for, boy, for men. I see, oh, isn't that strange? You wouldn't have none of these questions when you hear AIDS and HIV. AIDS, by the old definition, was disappearing rapidly. And um, as I mentioned before, when you look at uh, the graph of AIDS exploding from 1980 to um, up to 1992, and you see this tremendous rapid drop-off up to 1997, where we no longer have any data to distinguish between old AIDS, in other words, AIDS that is associated with real illness, and new AIDS, which is the T-cell count-based AIDS. So we see this inflation of total AIDS now. And again, even total AIDS is dropping off. But I think it was embarrassing to the CDC to see that the syndrome was almost gone. In other words, the syndrome of people that are antibody positive for HIV also um, getting ill. AIDS patients don't die. I mean, like, HIV positives do not die of AIDS today, very rarely. The vast majority now die of liver disease. In Massachusetts, the number one leading cause of death among people who are HIV positive is liver failure. And I don't think liver failure qualifies yet as an AIDS-defining disease. But these people are not, they're not counted as AIDS cases. They're just somebody who is HIV positive, given AIDS drugs, and the AIDS drugs killed their liver and they died. I seen side effects from there right away. I was on a combination of Viramune and Comprevir. I was losing weight. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. And the, and the pills that I was taking had to be taken with food. And I couldn't eat. And it, I began um, seeing liver damage. And I was taking off the medicines within a month of me taking them. We're finding out that medications um, are hurting killing people and not really killing the virus is causing other problems in our clients now and um, that's what's killing them the medicine instead of the virus. You hear a lot of doctors, you hear a lot of educators and age, you hear a lot of people talk about it is probably the drugs that are going to kill us before the disease does. 